Welcome back, everyone. This is Chase, and joining me today is Sigrid uh, Olson, a designer for Peak Performance. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. No, it's it's great to meet you. I know I've been following you a little bit on on Instagram for for a while, and and more and more, I'm just amazed by the designers that come into the orbit of our design program through tools like Instagram. Um, it's been been really fun to get to meet people in this industry who are doing really interesting things. And and I don't know if you've had this experience um, with your collection that you you created. It's so striking. We'll get into the collection, but it's so striking <laughs> and, and so perfect for Instagram. It was hard not, not to look at it. It drew me in. Um, I'm sure other people have that same experience. And so when I was first introduced to it, actually, um, you know, I, I had to set up something so we could talk a little bit more about it and the work that you're doing, which is incredible. So I appreciate you taking time. Well, thank you. Thank you. Have, have you had, how, how important has that been for you is we'll get into the collection in particular, but mm -hmm. how important has Instagram been for you to kind of build, build some momentum and build awareness around this, this, you know, these pieces that you've created? I don't know how much uh, Instagram has played a role in it, but it's, um, I, I think it's been a great platform for also for me to put out my ideas and um, not as much getting feedback on them, of course, a little bit, but I think it's, it's really good to, to see them yourself when you upload it, you see your own progress through your feed. Um, and it's it's cool to follow that development in your own projects in that way. Did and of was, course was that hard for yeah. you to get over that that feeling of putting your work out there the first time when it wasn't maybe in its perfect form? Yeah, that's always scary. Yeah, um, and there's also I think you kind of sometimes you also get up on your high horse and you're like, oh my god, what if someone steals my ideas? Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> But um, I've had a great uh, class. We were 15 people in my class and there were never any type of competition. We were never competing against each other, stealing each other's ideas. And we were always really um, supportive of each other. And we were talking about our ideas openly and loudly. And um, we realized and learned that by talking about your ideas and getting them out there, you get more feedback from each other on your ideas. So you actually learn more by putting it out there. So um, I don't think I was scared to put it out there, but it's always a little bit like, Ooh, oh. and then you know that after like half a year, you'll be like, you'll hate what you put up <laughs> because you moved so far past that, that you don't like looking at it again, but it's, I, it's, uh, it's good to put it up. Yeah. I guess that's a good sign, right? If you can look back and, and not feel embarrassed, obviously, but f see the progression, right. Or at least cringe just a little bit at what you initially yeah. put up compared to what you're putting up now, but it's all part of the process, right? Um, yeah, it is. W well, how did you get over that? Um, that feeling of, I, well, I, I guess first is the awareness that you had something special, right. And a recognition mm -hmm. that, oh, what I'm creating is pretty unique, right? Not everything that I, I think a lot of designers, you know, and some in our students, right? They'll create something and think it's like entirely unique, but, you know, you do a quick Google search and you quickly find out that it's, that idea has been done plenty of times before, but <laughs> yeah. in, in a few instances, you create something that is really special, like, well, like what you've done, um, how do you get over that feeling of, well, I don't want someone to take this. I know we've had students who have felt that way when they do have mm. something really special and they want to hold on to it, but, mm. but you've shared the benefits of sharing your work and um, the growth that comes from putting your work out into the world, kind of outweighing that chance that someone might steal it. How did you get over those feelings? Um, I've also been talking about this with my really good friends. Um, from my class and uh, we have experienced that like just recently one of my friends her um, degree work was actually her idea was stolen by another student in mm. another country and um, in the beginning you're like what is happening what is going on like how can she do this how but then you also start to when you actually go into it you see that oh but what the other person did is actually not as good as mm. the original idea because 
you need to remember that even though someone steals your idea, they're not you. So they actually, they can't complete the idea or do it as good as you would, or it will just turn out completely different, even though it's based on the same idea. Um, because aesthetics and the process um, and the development is so different from individual to individual. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the answer to it. <laughs> well, you, and you can always win out when it, like on, on execution, right? Just doing it that much better, right? And the authenticity that comes with this is my idea, like, like you said. Um, exactly. And I think that's the benefit of also putting your work out there, right? There's a timestamp on it. Not, not yeah. that that can protect you necessarily um, legally, just putting your work out there on Instagram, but, but um, at least there's a record of it and you can say, no, I, I did this right. Um, and I put there it out is. there first and for what that's worth, right? Again, there's no legal, um, you know, that doesn't hold any legal weight, but, but there's still something to that. Right. And, and again, um, real value in putting it out there um, as a part of the, yeah. the learning process. It definitely is. And like to turn it to a little bit of a positive side. It's so if someone steals your idea and you, you see it, then maybe they thought of something that you didn't, and then you can steal that back again and continue. Right. Right. So, well, and no one ever wants their idea <laughs> stolen, but that's validation no. too, right? That yeah. you're onto something, right? You're thinking in the right direction. And um, exactly. Which, which has got to be a good feeling, even though compliment taking your thing right it's that's probably <laughs> there's a lot of feelings you're you're working through when that happens yeah. but, um, there's a oh, lot of feeling in the design study generally right right <laughs> well we've kind of danced around it a little bit but um we, we should get into what what the project was um mm. i didn't know that it was a collection um that maybe you can share a little bit about the what what the collection is in general we've danced around the idea but we, we should yeah. probably share what you worked on <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it was my degree work from a bachelor collection, and uh, it's um, a collection based on the female body and the female athlete, um, and the second uh, focus was sustainability, so multifunction, multi-use, so sustainability and the female body, um, and it's... Uh, three outfits um, that I managed to make during COVID times. <laughs> uh, so three outfits that uh, are made for uh, a combination of mountain biking and backcountry skiing. And uh, the idea started from, um, I started to see this trend of free ride skiers that were tracking their carbon footprints and really getting into um, the sustainability part of it. And you also see that like um, flying with a helicopter, like heli skiing, that's not a huge thing anymore because people are starting to realize that, oh shit, if I want to get up on that mountain, I should probably do it by myself. Yeah. And also the, they probably get the feeling of they deserve to be on the top of the, mount the mountain when they get up to it themselves. Um, no, so there was this trend where free ride skiers, they started to uh, use their bikes, um, putting the skis on the bikes and everything and uh, going up into the mountains. And I know that it's been around for a while. I think the earliest um, uh, article I found about it was from 2008 or so. And then again, an article in 2013. But then I haven't really seen it getting as big as it has now recently um so that was also like the the third part of it that uh, that got me into this thinking that oh it could be cool to make like multifunctional clothing for this because also the the um, uh, the movements of cycling and skiing you don't really think of them as the same mm -hmm. movements so you're also a little bit like okay but if someone were actually gonna go skiing and they were cycling up to the mountain then wouldn't it be uncomfortable cycling in skiing pants, you know? Um, so that's where it all came in. And uh, yeah, and then I started the process. Well, and, and this was all part of your, your program. What, what was the program that you were, you were enrolled in? So uh, my bachelor is, I have a bachelor in fashion. 
um, fashion design. So it's not a sportswear program, a sportswear um, bachelor. Um, and I was the only one doing sportswear in my class. Uh, luckily, I had uh, one professor <laughs> in the entire university who were familiar with the sports so that I could get some, some feedback from and everything. Um, but it was um, uh, uh, the course it was the last course of my university degree. And it was from March until the 1st of June. So we didn't even have a lot of time. I think we had 11, 12 weeks or something to, to finish, start and finish the project. Then we had a couple of, of courses leading up to it with um, and design um, thinking and theory and such. So we had like started to think of the ideas, but but initially we had like 12 weeks to do it. Wow. Uh, so wow. it was intense, really intense. Uh, people were crying and we were breaking down and everything as you usually do. Yeah, I was gonna say, I've, I've seen those tears in our program. So yeah. 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 How, how did it feel, I guess, you know, this space, as we, as we know in our program, is pretty unique to have university programs that are focused on sports and outdoor products and apparel. Um, mm. In your program, you're the only one who was focused yeah. on this this category or this industry, which is such a large industry, but there's there's yeah. not a lot of um, opportunities to um, study to to break into this space. How was it being the only one? I, I you know. I, there's a lot of value that comes when, when having, you know, other people in your programs who can support you and give you feedback. And I'm sure you still got that. Um, but on the, on the outdoor side, you're, you're dealing with technical fabrics and performance and, um, you know, how, how was that in, in a fashion program? What, what struggles did you face? Did, did you actually find some opportunities, um, you know, being, being in that environment? Um, what, what was that experience like? It was tough um, and it was very challenging because it was, as it is on these programs, it is learning by doing, but it was even more learning by doing that. I didn't have any supervisors or anyone that knew more than me. Like I, were, I was the expert in the area the whole mm. time. Um, so I really had to... Uh, to search for it myself, um, of course, it was it was great in the sense that people would uh, challenge me aesthetically, and they would challenge me in shape uh, and in in color um, and such. Um, so the technical part, I had to do it myself. But I also I I think that it it gives it. Um, uh, it also, it's a positive thing because if there's, I don't know how to put it down in words exactly, but um, they have another set of eyes mm -hmm. than we do. Like we are like technical focused and fabrics and high tech and lightweight and everything, but they're so much more focused on what you see with your eye, aesthetically pleasing um, and, and traditional pattern making. So there was also a lot to learn by that um, and valuable um, feedback from my fellow students um, that I couldn't be without. Yeah, but. Well, um, well, more and more, I think people want performance products that that on that perform on the mountain, but look great in the city. Right. There's and, mm. and that's just I think more and more. Um, you know, lu luxury and performance are coming together. And I mean, North Face Gucci was kind of the latest <laughs> version of that, right? Um, <laughs> so it, it seems like that that other set of eyes is so valuable, right? As, as outdoor apparel, performance apparel is being used more and more by people who aren't necessarily going out to, to push it to its limits, right? More and more yeah. people are using it for you know, as, as pure fashion. So I, I think that's exactly that, that other set of eyes is so important. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Um, but the, the huge challenge was of course that, um, I actually didn't have a lot of, uh, support during, uh, during the degree project. There was a lot of 
uh, I had to fight through it because no one really understood what I was doing. They understood the idea of it and they understood that it was new and new thinking. Um, but they really didn't have um, any, any good feedback to give me. And actually the course that was leading up to this, which was like an introduction course to the degree work where we were just supposed to uh, try out our craziest ideas and everything. And I made these mock-ups and prototypes and like weird colors and with weird fabric and it didn't really fit together color-wise. Um, and one leg was different from the other and everything. But that's the way that you do it in the outdoor industry. You know, you make a mock-up pants and then one leg is something and another is another. And to test out the different versions, then my teachers didn't understand that. So they were like, this is not complete. Um, and they had, <laughs> they made me retake uh, the exam of the course because they didn't feel that I actually had done it. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> so 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 that was like uh, one uphill battle that I had in the beginning uh, and then another uphill battle was I actually came crying out like hardcore crying from the first supervision that I had with one of the supervisors and <laughs> it was just I was devastated and completely broken because I had um in the beginning of this uh, this project, I went a week, uh, went away uh, for a week skiing in the Norwegian mountains, um, both because, you know, it's good for the soul, <laughs> but also because I wanted to do the research that I needed to do for this project. I needed to go touring, ski touring and backcountry skiing and do these things. And even though I know them, I needed to feel them on my body, like freshly. Uh, and then when I came back, my supervisor was so angry with me and she completely talked me down and said that I would never make up that one week that I lost and I didn't prioritize my time and everything. And <laughs> I think that's also the difference between outdoor, the outdoor industry and the fashion industry that the outdoor industry is outdoor people. They understand that you need to use the product. You need to feel the nature and the sport and everything on your body. And the fashion industry is more work 24 hours a day. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a product like yours, uh, like in some regards, products like this are personal protective equipment, right? It's it's a matter yeah. of safety, right? It's a matter of comfort. And you can only know that by testing it, right? And the amount of testing exactly. that, that goes into creating these products is, that's that's a major difference, right? Between um, fashion and, and performance apparel. Where did, did you have, so you were able to field test, mm -hmm. where you, did you have access to other testing equipment? Um, or did you have access to tools to do the prototyping? Because this is all seam sealed. Um, I imagine your program didn't necessarily have all the right tools for performance apparel. How did you navigate some of those unique tools that you needed access to? Mm -hmm. I cheated. No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my stuff isn't actually, uh, they're not steam sealed oh, because okay. um, uh, COVID came in March and that was like when we were starting to make the project. So you, our university shut down. Hmm. We didn't have access to our facilities, so I didn't have access to the same sealing machine or the tape machine. Hmm. Um, so that is also why I, I put the reflective tape outside of the seams because I didn't even have to look at the inner seams <laughs> because hmm. I couldn't. <laughs> so that was a fortunate in the way that I got a new expression by, by putting the tape on the outside. And I think that's also um, the good thing about uh, doing a fas fashion program and, and not a sports directed program because you can get away with that. It's a little bit more imaginative in the fashion mm -hmm. course. You can say this represents the seam ceiling uh, and they'll be fine, great, it's perfect. Whereas um, probably in a more technical course, it would be like, this should be seam sealed because it right. needs to be like wear tested and everything. Right. So, so that's probably also a good thing about the fashion program um, that you have a little bit more creative um, freedom um, uh, and, and uh, not make it as correctly as it should be probably. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
with that set, are you happy with the outcome? Right. It sounds like that altered the the direction of the design, which is kind of life, right? I mean, that's life mm. working for a company, right? Unforeseen circumstances that maybe alter yeah. the direction of the of the product. What what are your thoughts on that? It's problem solving. And that's also what, when you end up in the industry as a designer, is problem solving, like 90% of the time. Um, so figuring out, and I think that's what also got me into this, this part of the industry, that problem solving is cool. Finding little loopholes that you can solve bigger issues with. Um, and then through these uh, challenges, um, and the restrictions that you have, you find new ways uh, of using what you already got. Well, it sounds like you treated your whole bachelor's program that way, right? As a problem yeah. to be solved, right? <laughs> it um, was really a problem to be solved. Uh, how, I, I guess I want to take another step back. D when did you recognize that you wanted to make products? Is that something that you've always been interested in? Have you always been a creative person? Where did some of that start for you? I've always been a creative person. I've always been interested in what we put on our bodies. Uh, I've always been very, um, um, I've been thinking about the aesthetics, uh, very aesthetic person. Um, but uh, I was brought up in an academic uh, family. Uh, <laughs> uh, so my parents, uh, they taken a science degree uh, at a university. Uh, so that was uh, also in my cards um, that I needed a proper education. So I started studying geology in Oslo. Um, but I quickly realized that I, I needed to be more creative. I needed to use my hands or my, my brain in another way. And I didn't really know why. And then uh, at a coincidence and a family holiday in Denmark, we walked past the uh, design school in Copenhagen. And that was just like something in my brain that clicked. And I just, I didn't know that it was possible to study design. And I saw these incredible pieces and it was like the second year uh, exhibition. And I was like, oh my God, people in the second year have made this like from scratch. Uh, so uh, I understood that I could actually do what I really was interested in. And then, um, and then I applied into, applied to, I don't know if you have that in the States. We have these types of schools between high school and university. Uh, where we can uh, go for one year or two years and uh, it's kind of like a camp or what you can call it like <laughs> in some schools you can live at the school and uh, and there are different directions to do it so I found this design school that I went went to for a year um, that pushed design theory and making and everything um, and uh there was one teacher and she was like, uh, I had this one huge project that I was going to make and I did not know what I should do. And she just looked at me and she was like, but cigarette, you're going to make sportswear. And I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and she was just like, but it's so clear, like that's what you should do. And uh, it was really clear. And sometimes you just need someone to like, yeah, tell you the truth or yeah make you and just i know how to put it but someone needs to open your eyes right well well i i don't know if you had this experience but I, I i had this living in utah the outdoor industry is just a part of life and so maybe you don't yeah. even recognize that it is a, an industry that you can be a part of i don't know if you had that experience growing up you're just surrounded by outdoor activities that it's just you don't know any different is is that yeah sound accurate. It, it was yeah completely accurate i grew up in no like i am danish but i grew up in norway um uh so so we've always been outdoors every day skiing in the winter and like you had to probably and in the summer you're just out hiking and spending mm -hmm. time in the mountains and it's just so natural to us um 
And I've always been thinking about my clothing, like why is this pocket here? Or why is it so low waisted? Or why does it look like this? And this should be here. And <laughs> why is this backpack shaped like this? <laughs> so of course it's like small things that you've been thinking about and everything, but it's so natural to you, as you said, that you don't really realize that it's a special thing. Right. Yeah. What, what and then my our... teacher in Denmark, she just saw it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. You need, you definitely need people from the outside, that different perspective to come in and kind of wake, yeah. wake you up to that possibility. We, one of our yeah. graduates, um, she was part of our first graduating class, but um, she was hiking, hiking a trail, like a long, long trail somewhere in, in the U S I don't remember where, but she was with a group and it was just hours on end, you know, hiking with one person in front of the other. And, and she was just staring at the the backpack ahead of her. And that was her moment. She was just, she had nothing else to look at, but the backpack in front of her. And that's when she realized someone made that yeah. thing, right? Like someone made this. Um, and then that's when she eventually discovered our program and, um, and is now working in the industry herself. But yeah, it, I think everyone kind of comes to it, um, you know, from a different, a different path. Right. And, um, yeah. but, you know, in our program, we're trying to help people recognize there is a path into the industry. Right. Um, mm. and, um, and we're trying to buy our best. I think we're doing a good job at it so far, but, but, you know, we want people to recognize, Oh, this is a viable industry that I could be a part yeah. of. And there's an on-ramp for me to, to jump into. Um, so it's interesting to hear hear your path and and how you got in, into the industry and how you've been surrounded by the industry your whole life. It sounds like a lot of our students in a way. Yeah, and I think that when the final light, like when I realized for real that this was going to be my thing, because I started this fashion course at university, and there was all these fas amazing fashion students around me, and everyone was making amazing things, and I was just not making amazing things because when I went into university I tried making fashion but I couldn't like I I cannot I can't make fashion I cannot make a pair of pants <laughs> um like cool pair of pants uh, but I can make sportswear of course but I was uh, at an exchange in Australia and I met all these amazing people these outdoor people um and we started um uh, climbing together I had never climbed before and uh, we went out um, camping and everything and everyone was so extreme and so cool and I just that is when I realized that these products are what's like keeping us alive in this moment mm. and I think that's when I fell like really in love with it um, at the moment I like started testing it for real in the nature um, yeah, that, what, what you said there kind of sounds like a, a personal design statement, right? And we try to tell our students to, to come up with their own design statement, right? It's like what they're about, why they create. Have you done that for yourself? Well, I guess what, and maybe not in the formal, you know, written down, but what, what drives you, what drives your designs? Like what keeps you creating these types of products? What motivates your designs? Uh, my own adventures and sustainability, I think. Right. And then the people I meet. Hmm. D definitely your your collection. What what do you call your collection? I keep calling it the collection, but I'm sure <laughs> the it has collection. <laughs> it's called bike to ski. Bike to ski. So easy. <laughs> right. Right. No, that's easy to remember. Um, I can see how those different. Um, values are, are all, you know, come together in bike to ski. Um, I, I guess speak, speak to that a little bit. I, I think this idea of multi-use is really interesting within the larger conversation around sustainability, because it seems like there's, there's not one solution to achieve, achieve sustainability. I don't, I don't even know what that necessarily means. Um, yeah. <laughs> but there's, there's, you know, biodegradability, there's um, creating more durable products, it's uh, designing with repair in mind, um, multi-use products. Um, I just think that idea of multi-purpose is, is a really interesting direction um, to try to achieve a more sustainable future, right? Cre buying one product that you can use for various activities. Um, 
I think the outdoor industry, we like stuff like we like gear. We like have, yeah. we like having specialized things that we like gadgets in a way, right? We're kind of technology averse, but we like specific products that do a certain thing. Um, yeah. did We're you feel, gear slaves. Right. Did you feel any resistance to this kind of a, a project? Cause it's like, well, then I, I can't, I don't have my bike kit or my, my, ski parka, right? Like you're taking that away from me and putting it into one. Was there any resistance? Yes, <laughs> of course there is. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I also think uh, I got over it with the idea that most of us have this one jacket that we just love, you know? Uh like, don't you have a jacket that you just love? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Exactly. And then I was just, I think what drove me was the idea of having this jacket that I really love. If it was, if I could actually use it for every occasion, how cool wouldn't that be? Mm -hmm. Like, then you can love that jacket to death. And then if you love it enough to death, it'll probably last for like five years <laughs> if right. you're very much outdoors. <laughs> And then, then it's it goes to in in through a cycle, um, end of life cycle, and and there's different ways to do that. Um, and then you can you can find another jacket to love to death, um, mm -hmm. and it'll still be better to love a jacket for five years and have it completely torn apart. Would be better than only three jackets and not really using them, and then they run out of you don't really feel that they're cool enough anymore they're not trendy and then you buy a new one after five years anyways right right well i i think this is the challenge that the industry is facing i i think we figured out that um outdoor equipment is something that you only need to buy you know one of and it lasts a lot longer like climbing harness can last you years right yeah. and you're not using it daily necessarily uh, a jacket on the other hand something that you could be using every day whether it's an out like a an extreme activity or not and so we see more and more brands getting into the apparel space and creating outerwear um so that i kind of feel like the industry is being flooded with more product but not always yeah. better more durable more sustainable more multi-purpose product that you could love to death right um, it seems like yeah. that's the crisis that we're facing, which you're, I, I'm sure, motivated this this project. It is a it is a problem for the industry because they do the brands want to make money, mm -hmm. you know. Also, going into peak performance, like understanding the industry from the inside, mm -hmm. like you also need uh, you call it the revenue, like you need the sales, you need to make money, and right. you do that by product. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a hard puzzle to figure out. Uh, but in the end, like when you go, if, for example, when you go ski touring, or if you go um, hiking or touring for multiple days, you want to pack as lightly as possible. So eventually it does, it does go down to, to that one product because you're not going to be bringing two different shell jackets. Mm -hmm. You're only going to be bringing that one lightweight amazing jacket that you know has gotten you through two expeditions before mm -hmm. um so so there is a lot um there is a, a lot of challenges uh, for the industry to to tackle um, and uh sadly there is not a right answer to it right well the other issue that the, the issue that that the industry is is needs to face more and more um and I'm including myself in this that that we need to face is this idea of creating better product for women uh which was the other facet of this project right um yes I mean I'm just looking at the items kind of around my office backpacks footwear I mean all of most of it probably here was designed by a man with a man in mind mm -hmm. um mm -hmm just inherently, right? It's like, okay, well, mm -hmm. I'm, by default, I'm going to create something for me. Um, I, you know, I think what, what you're doing is, is, is very special in that you're creating, you know, product specific for women. Um, I don't know if you want to speak more to that um, and, mm -hmm. and the motivation for that. I imagine some of that probably came from not being able to find product that, that worked for you and your needs. 
um, specifically. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, maybe speak to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always been um, stealing uh, clothing from my dad. Uh, right. And as my brother got older, stealing clothing from my brother. Um, I've always uh, taken my dad's ski jackets for some reason. I couldn't find that, you know, in, in when was it, 2008 and nine and stuff. It was this really like baggy style that was in, it was trendy. And then I couldn't really find these baggy stuff for women. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit more fitted and the patterns weren't that cool and the colors were too pink or something. So I, I would take my dad's like huge extra large ski jacket and use that. And also the feedback I got was like, it was great. People thought I looked so cool. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that was uh, that's always been in my mind. Like, why why doesn't this fit me? Why can't I have it? And then I've used it anyways. Uh, and then I uh, was at an internship at uh, Noruana. Uh, probably know it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in 2019, uh, amazing people, amazing company. I am extremely grateful. Um, but I also, I asked, uh, I asked the designers, um, the design director, uh, is it like, how, why are we only making this for men? Because it was, there was like new styles that were only being developed for men. And he said that, um, like he would love to develop it for women, but sadly the market is bigger for men in that exact category so that they would develop the prototypes for men first. And then they would just, then they would convert it to the women yeah. or to women, to the female body. But, and it made so much sense because that's what has been done always. Um, uh, so I think that's when the idea for real came in. That I was just like, this is like not cool because I want to be considered too, right. <laughs> you know? Uh, and I did some research on the numbers. And uh, of course, it says that um, men are um, superior in the designer roles in the sportswear industry. Um, it's changing a little bit, I think, um, in my team at Peak Performance. There's definitely a lot of women. And it's, it's cool. And we do have some female pushes, which is great. Um, but we do need to have more of those. Uh, but I do believe that it's coming. Yeah, I think so too. I'm definitely seeing that in our program. We have our own challenges around um, trying to create um, an environment and recruiting. And I mean, we're, we're facing some of our, our own challenges there, trying to create a pipeline that works for everyone, right? Um, yeah. And, and is a pipeline that works for women who are work, you know looking to break into this industry. And um, I, I think what you said uh, was, was really interesting around product well being considered right I, I liked that the way you phrased that right um i it, it's interesting that a lot of this product right is built from the ground up with men in mind and then scaled down right i mean we yeah. hear shrink it shrink it and pink it a lot but exactly but but i i was listening to a, a podcast 99 percent invisible uh design mm -hmm. it's kind of a design podcast but um they were talking about um I think it was car design, how cars are designed with kind of yes. the standard man I know. Mind. and seat belts, right. Are, are yeah. built for men and it kind of really everything in the built world being, um, yeah. with, with kind of the average man in mind because they're it's designed by average men. Right. And, and I think mm. they, they, I don't remember in particular, but they got into, you know, how much more, like if you get in a car crash in a car, because mm. the car isn't designed for women, Mm. it kills more women, right? If mm. you're in a car crash, because the car isn't designed with a woman in mind. I, I, that was kind of a, a moment for me when I recognized, oh, wow, like the, this whole built world that we're a part of, right, is, is built for um, a certain person, um, which was interesting um, and yeah. really eye-opening. Um, and scary. <laughs> and scary, absolutely. So, I, you know, there's, you know, we're, we're trying to play our part um, in, in pushing against that and creating more opportunity, but, but that's, that's the challenge we face for sure. And I, I'm with you. I see us trending in the right direction, but there, obviously there's still more, more to be done. 
Yeah, and I think that's just inspirational for the women to come in this industry, mm. for the young female designers. Like, do it. Do you think? Go out there, design for you, because uh, we actually need it. The industry needs it, and it will be appre- appreciated if if you show it. Right. Oh, absolutely. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your current role. So uh, what was that transition mm-hmm. like for you to go from, you obviously had an internship, um, with a great company. Um, what was the transition like to go from, um, uh, you know, a university program to the workforce? What was that like for you? How did that opportunity come about and what, what was the transition like? Ooh, everything happened really fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I took my, uh, I, I finished my degree in, um, I took my, de- my, my degree in Sweden. Um, and then during, when COVID came in March last year, uh, I moved home to my parents in Norway because I didn't want to live in my like studio flat and have everything done in that flat. Like I wouldn't be able to leave my project. Mm which you won't anyway when you're in like it will always be in your head but it's nice to like be able to lock a door (laughs) um so i moved home to norway in march um finished my degree in june and then i had like a summer holiday and everything and then after that i started applying for jobs and then in october um in september peak um came out with this position an open position and i applied for it and I was, uh, I was through three interview rounds uh, and then my amazing uh, boss, she, she called me and she was like, I know that it's like, I know it's COVID and it's not so safe to travel and uh, we need to consider it, but we really want you to come in like for a personal interview for this role. And I was actually a little bit hesitant because I was like, oh, no, I just came back to Norway. You know, I just moved home again to the mountains and everything, because even though Sweden has a lot of mountains from like half, half the half south part of Sweden, there aren't really any mountains. You can't go hiking in that way. And I really missed it. And I so I was a little bit hesitant, but I was like, you know what? Peak Performance is a great company and it would be like an amazing opportunity. So I can't like, I can't say no to it, um, to just thought of it. So I, I went to Stockholm and I had an amazing interview and she offered me the job on the spot. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, great. But when do you start? And she was like, as soon as possible. Can you move here now? <laughs> so I went home, had two weeks to pack and then I, borrowed my parents car and then I drove to Sweden uh with all my stuff uh, and and started straight away so it was like everything happened really fast and it was uh, as if someone just turned on the switch and I was like completely blinded <laughs> wow yeah no, that's a wor- that's yeah. a whirlwind um yeah what what do you um, feel like set you apart um and really set you you up to mm-hmm. for the position what what were the things that really stood out uh yeah i've 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 heard uh from my colleagues and everyone who like went through some of the like the resumes and and all the applications that came in and um, they've said that i did stick out um and it was very clear that uh, i was made for the role and i think it's because we don't have this sports degree we don't have the sportswear degree in Scandinavia mm-hmm. or in Europe or on this part of the planet. So I had specialized in something that no one else really specialized in because everyone else did fashion. Um, right. So I was, um, it was just a smart move for me to um, focus on a niche or like focus on the sportswear industry because no one else were. So well, it really was as simple as that. Right. Well, and finding a way to create your own degree in a lot of ways, I'm sure is a standout, right? Like it's easy to go through a university program and just do what is given to you, right? Complete the degree as it's, as it's presented. But I imagine that that really stands out when someone sees, oh, wow, you, you've kind of built your own degree program in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, in a, in a lot of ways, you might say that. But I think our, our university was also so amazing that it, was, um, it wasn't it was really put up as like 
one straight road. Everyone, right. it, everyone was really, um, um, what do you call it? Um, they, they wanted us to make our own degree. They wanted mm. us to make our own path. So um, I believe all my classmates are really strong. And the people that come out from that school is really strong in that way that they have created their, whole, their own path the whole three years that they've gone to the school. Right. Um, yeah. Well, what is, um, I, we, we glossed over this a little bit, but your bike to ski, I'm going back to that, mm-hmm. bike to ski, mm-hmm. Um, got a lot of recognition, um, well-deserved recognition. Do you mind sharing a little bit about that? I know that you were a part of a few different exhibits and showcases. Um, maybe share share a little bit about some of those experiences that you had. Um, uh, it, it has been crazy, <laughs> and it is crazy. Uh, it, I was I was kind of I was not the star student for three years. <laughs> Uh, as I said, the teachers didn't really understand me. So I've had a, a few uphill battles. So I, I came out of the university and into the industry not really thinking that I was good. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so it, it, I, it came as a huge surprise that someone wanted me, someone wanted to give me a prize for something that I made. And especially since fashion isn't often... No, sportswear isn't often considered in the fashion industry, uh, you know, and all um, it's, it's, it's thought of as like a design, it's a design award, uh, but I didn't really think that I would uh, be considered into that with sportswear. Uh, so it was amazing to see that, yes, sportswear is a part of the industry and it is actually appreciated but it's maybe not as common. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's been great, crazy and the feedback has been amazing. Um, and what I am most happy about is that um, uh, people are appreciating the new thinking within the sportswear industry. Uh, and appreciating the sustainability thinking uh, within the fashion industry and the sportswear industry. Um, so to me, it's just really great that it gets so much attention. Right. With the, with bike to ski, I know you're you're busy with with peak performance. Um, where do you do you do you feel like you've kind of closed the book on bike to ski? Is there more that you'd like to do? I know you're you're busy with a full-time job, but is that mm. a project that you still see um, an opportunity to develop further or is, are there things that you, is there a direction that you want to take that further? I haven't thought about anything like for now. <laughs> I definitely haven't closed that chapter. Um, Um, I still have it in the back of my head, um, but I'm not really sure if the industry is ready for it. Uh, And I know it's too much for me to take on personally to develop. Um, I don't feel I have the experience or the knowledge of the industry yet um, to take that on as a full on project, um, launching it. but um, I do believe that there's something valuable in that project that should be taken further um, at some point. Uh, and that it could be applied to other areas as well, other sports. Um, yeah. Well, it's that, I, I feel like that's common just among designers, right? It's like you, you've, you've developed something and you know, you, you can keep it on the back burner. That's fine. Right. You don't necessarily, mm. you, you pick things up, pick something off, off the shelf and you use it and then you put it back and you'll mm. return to it. Right. When, when, um, you know, it's, it's the right time to do that. Um, I, I see that in our students too, um, for sure. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes in the future, but I, I guess kind of as a, maybe kind of wrapping up a little bit, but I think what's really interesting about your story is that you recognized an opportunity um, because you participate in a sport, because you were doing, you know, research in this area. Um, 
you know, I, I think it's really powerful that you just trusted yourself and trusted your research to go and develop something, right? That was new. And you, I, and maybe you were afraid to do that. I don't know. I, I, but I, I, I hope that our students can, can learn to do that as well, right? It's like trust, trust yourself, trust the research that you've put into, um, you know, maybe a, a new category that you're looking to develop. Um, but, but can you speak to that a little bit? Like, I'm sure you doubted yourself in different ways as you were developing this, this collection, but, um, how do you, how do you learn to do that, to trust your own instincts, trust your own intuition, um, to do something new and do things that are impactful? Mm. It is, as you said, like trust your instincts, but it's easier said than done. Yeah. I think the first two years of my university degree, I did not trust myself at all i uh i did what what i got uh for feedback from my teachers um i trusted them more than i trusted myself and during like smaller projects um where i didn't have time to listen to the teacher we didn't get feedback i would go on my own instincts um and i started to see that the projects that i did myself where i just went on and like followed my gut were actually the best projects um and the other projects where i had where i didn't trust myself were like the lesser projects mm. uh or didn't give me as much inspiration um so it was actually just in my final year <laughs> of three years that i understood that holy if i if i want to make a good project i should actually just go with what i want um, but it's, it's trial and error and you need to, to figure that out yourself, uh, and also understand how to make good decisions, right. uh, and to get to know your own process, uh, because everyone has a different process and that's the, the process is the best part of it all. Um, so develop my best tip, I think would be like develop a good process that works for you find some theories and methods that you love and just go with them combine them go with them and see what you find right seems like that's the that's the way to do what, like you didn't become a subject matter expert over an area right mm. I, I think a lot of students don't think that they can be an expert um but but i think you used that term right when you were looking at this this intersection of bike and ski, right? I, I don't know how many people are doing that, right? But you were the one who pushed it and mm. did the research and explored that. And and there's still opportunities for for people to do that, right? It's like everyone has a specific interest um, within this industry that whether it develops into a large category or not, right? You can still become that subject matter expert over over some kind of, you know, an area, which I think is really interesting that, you, that you've done. Um, no, I love that. That's really great feedback. And I hope our students take that to heart. Um, any, I guess, any parting thoughts or tips for aspiring product designers or whether there are students or other, other people looking to break into this space? Mm -hmm. Um, oh, so I have so many <laughs> thoughts in my head. Uh, specifically always be curious like always be curious and ask a lot of questions uh the feedback that i get from my colleagues just starting in peak performance is they say cigarette never stop asking questions um so do that be curious um do what you love because if you love something enough it'll be great in one way or another and if it's not continue working on it <laughs> right i love that that's great well, how do, how's the best way to stay in touch with you and your work and just keep up with everything that you're doing? Instagram. Instagram's the place until it's, it's not place. anymore. Yeah. Until it's not. <laughs> yeah. I haven't really gotten onto that portfolio online platform, like whole web page site. Uh, I probably should, but for now, Instagram is the, is the easiest. <laughs> That's great. Well, we'll share that because I, you're the work that you have posted there is incredible. And we talked a lot about bike to ski, but you've got to see it. And I know that you've got a great video that was part of that, an exhibit that you were a part of that, that you talk more in depth about the the collection itself. And so I'll, I'll link to that in the description for this episode as well. So people can check that out. Great. Thank you. This has been awesome. I appreciate you taking the time. This has been fun. It's been amazing. 
Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. (laughs) 